But the fun thing about these kind of vehicles are they're easy to restore because they're basically putting together a model, you know? You, you really don't need the instructions to figure out how everything goes. Everything is nuts and bolts and, and, and no electronics, no computer. Uh, that's what makes it easy. Another episode of Jay Leno's Garage, the vehicle we're featuring today, 1961 Chevrolet Corvair Rampside. This was one of the most innovative vehicles ever developed by General Motors uh, because what it is is a pickup truck. And realize pickup trucks have looked the same, I don't know, for the previous 60 or 70 years since the Model T pickup truck. They all look the same, engine in front, cab, and then the bed. This was truly innovative. Engine in the rear, independent suspension. Actually the first, I think, truck to have uh, independent suspension. And it really was a bit of a gamble. A man named Ed Cole was president of General Motors at the time, and Ed was one of those mechanical geniuses. You know, it's funny, General Motors always works best when they have an engineer at the helm. You know, during the 70s and 80s, you know, marketing guys and whatever. Now you got Mark Royce who's in there. He's a real engineer and they're doing great things with Corvette and Cadillac. And Ed Cole was like that too, a very innovative guy. He was enamored of the uh, Volkswagen. See, you have to remember, after the war, uh, Chevrolet was going to build a car called the Cadet, which was a small economy car. But we'd won the war and money was, you know, being flashed around and people wanted big, expensive cars. Uh, 1958 was probably the most excessive year in the history of American automobiles. They put chrome on everything. You've ever seen a 58 Buick Limited or any of the Oldsmobiles from that period? In fact, uh, even President Eisenhower at the time, there was a recession in the late 50s. And he said, I think it's because of the 1958 models. Have you seen these things? And that didn't help at all because everything was so ornate and overdone and heavy and gas guzzling. But Ed Cole was behind the scenes developing the Corvair, both in the truck form and in the passenger car. And as I said, he was enamored of the Volkswagen, the Tatra, these are air-cooled automobiles. And you know, the automobile industry, at least in America, pretty conservative. Back in the 30s, Chrysler came out with the Chrysler Airflow. Now, they made an imperial version of the Chrysler Airflow. And the imperial prior to that looked like Packards and Duesenberg's big grill in the front and a, you know, a long hood and you know, very prestigious looking car. And the Airflow was a true aerodynamically designed car. It just didn't look like anything else on the road. And consequently, it was a huge bomb because it didn't look like a big, impressive car. And the auto industry said, we can't move too fast on this stuff. So when Cole came up with the, the idea for the Corvair, it was, uh, it was a huge deal. When the Corvair was unveiled in 1960, uh, oh, cover of Time magazine, I think, in 59 or 60 with Ed Cole on the cover, it was seen as the most innovative automobile ever introduced. Uh, Ed Cole, of course, was riding on the success of the small block Chevy. The 265 V8 was his. Uh, they produced their 100 millionth version of that, I think, in 2011. Uh, it's still basically the same engine they're using today. So that shows you uh, the innovator he was. He, he came up with techniques to make engines lighter, faster, and more efficient. I mean, the Chevy small block weighed less than the six cylinder it replaced, and it had more cylinders and uh, a lot more horsepower. So when he introduced his Corvair, this was another innovation from Ed Cole. Uh, unfortunately, the six cylinder engine cost a lot more to produce than he thought because you had cast iron heads and you had six individual cylinders as opposed to you know, stamping out a core and making a block that way. That could be done a lot cheaper and more efficiently. So the Corvair wound up costing more and weighing about uh, 78 or 80 pounds more than the target weight. But that is neither here nor there. Let's get back to uh, the ramp side. It's called the Corvair 95 because that was the wheelbase. The normal wheelbase in the Corvair, I think, was 108 inches. This 
was shortened to 95 inches for this application. Now you might notice this one looks different than some of the other videos you're doing because we're uh, social distancing and all of that here. I'm here in the garage by myself and we have the camera on a tripod and I, I stop and run over and then move it again. Uh, we show these out of order. You might see the next one might be one we taped prior to all this coming down. But uh, we're doing a few like this. We just did one with the 57 Chrysler. People seem to like that one. So uh, in some ways it's kind of interesting because it's a bit more personal. You know, I'm here at the garage by myself and it's quiet and uh, uh, we can just <laughs> take our time a little bit here. But let's get back to, uh, let's get back to the Corvair. This is a vehicle I found right up the street, less than a mile from my shop. We're in an industrial area. And this is behind a building with a bunch of junk piled on it. As you can see from these photos, it's a little, it's a little rough. I paid $600 for it. This is the kind of vehicle you buy for $600, you put 50 grand in it, you sell it for $12.5. Yeah, that's, uh, that's just like the stock market. Um, you know, I like to collect unusual vehicles. You know, it's funny, uh, when you collect stuff like Ferraris, I know Ferrari guys have all these fancy Ferraris, and uh, someone asked me, why don't you have any Ferraris? I, I like them, they're wonderful cars, I just can't afford the books. Like when you go to the bookstore to buy a Ferrari book, it's always in a limited slip case, and it's leather, and it's signed by Chef Boy or D or somebody, you know, and it's like $490. I went down to a used bookstore right here in Burbank, I found three Corvair books, Assassination of the Corvair, The Corvair Decade, excellent book, and Corvair by Chevrolet. I said, how much for these three books? The guy said, eh, give me 25 bucks. I said, fine, that's okay. Huh? You can build a library it's cheaper when you don't collect the fancy stuff. Plus, I don't know, with what's going on now with the pandemic, this is the kind of vehicle you want to drive in a pandemic. You don't want to be driving around in a Lamborghini with open exhaust pipes looking like uh, some deposed dictator's idiot son, you know. And, and, and when people see this kind of thing, they smile and they wave. And uh, it's just a real friendly, goofy looking vehicle. And it was really startling when it came out in 61 because it didn't look like anything else on the road. This is the very first cab forward. You know, the Ford Econoline and Dodge, they all came out with their version, which had traditional engine in the front with rear wheel drive. This is rear wheel drive also. And you know, this was not certainly the safest automobile. This is the kind of vehicle, the only advantage is when you have an accident, you're the first one on the scene because you're sitting right here. Your legs are, are right here, okay? So you're, you're never more than literally six inches from the crash. I mean, this is where my legs are when I'm in the car. Uh, as I said, this car was $2,200, brand new. And these were popular for deliveries and uh, with the ramp side, you'll see that in a minute. The, it's called ramp side because it folds down and the phone company liked these because they could wheel those big spools of wire into these. So they bought a whole bunch of these for fleet sales. 61 was their biggest year. I think they sold 11,000 of them. And then they kind of, they weren't quite as practical as the Ford and Chevy version. See, the trouble is you got the engine in the back, so the bed is higher in the back where the engine goes. Uh, they built three of these. There was the core van, which was a van version, the load side, and then the ramp side, which, which this one was. I think this was the most popular version of the ramp side. Not a lot of options, AM, FM radio. It always makes me laugh stuff that we accepted back in the day, you'd never accept now. Like, see, you got a vent window, so you open this vent window, but, oh, gee, it hits the mirror. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. You know, <laughs> you couldn't get away with that today. Well, you can move the mirror and do that if you want, but just the idea that it actually hits the mirror, is, uh, it, just, it just makes me laugh. It comes from the factory like that, you know. You know, when I started this website 13 years ago, this is one of the first vehicles we did, but it's never been on YouTube, so I've just been going through the garage during this whole pandemic thing, trying to find vehicles that have never been on the YouTube channel. I realized this is one of them. I love driving this thing. It's just so goofy with having the, it reminds me of my uh, Mercedes Transporter. See with the wheels being back further here. And the Corvair had some advantages over other cars. Power steering was not necessary because the engine was in the back, so it was very easy to steer. 
uh, being air cooled, obviously no radiator, no water pump, no coolant, all that kind of stuff. Uh, disadvantages, uh, the heater was not good because it was air cooled. There was a gasoline heater that they had as an option. Uh, you got about 26 miles per gallon, but when you turn on the gasoline heater, you got less than 10. And uh, somehow a gasoline heater in a car it doesn't sound the safest thing, you know. But again, safety was not a priority in 1960 the way it is today. I believe this is the first unibody uh, that the Chevrolet did. I mean, this really caused a big ruckus when it came out. It was, it was, because no truck had ever looked like this. I mean, we, it's, it's, it's a shape we've sort of gotten used to over the years. But uh, much like the minivan or the Mustang, this, this, uh, made some waves and, and it was uh, pretty popular. Let, let's go around the back and I'll show you, show you the engine, how that works. The way you access it, a little different than the standard, uh, than the standard uh, Corvair engine. It had, uh, I think, stronger, more durable exhaust valves because it was doing work. It was a truck. Um, actually, this thing weighed 2,600 pounds, but it had a gross vehicle weight of about 4,700 pounds. So you could carry three quarters of a ton in this thing. So it, it, it was pretty durable. Um, you access to check the oil through here. You open this door and this is your dipstick right there. And then you have your, of course, your oil filter there. And this should slam shut. There we go. Now to access the engine, you drop the tailgate and you unscrew these two here. We added these wooden slats. Uh, this is just a regular truck bed. We added the wood here just to give it a little bit more style. There's your engine there. 145 cubic inches, 80 horsepower, 128 foot-pounds of torque. Uh, as I said, more durable exhaust valves, a few different things. This would be the normal place to check the dipstick in a Corvair. There was one of these uh, rubber plugs here and I touched it and it disintegrated because it was so old. So I stuck that plug in, that is not stock. Uh, as I mentioned before, dual carburetors, which made it a bit more expensive. Very rare to have an American car with dual carburetors. It wasn't some big high performance thing like a, a Chrysler with two four barrels or something. So that was a little unusual. Larger alternator. I can't remember originally had a generator and we put that alternator in there. I think it came with the alternator. I can't remember that. Sorry about that. But wonderful little motor. Not uh, just a fascinating piece of kit, this thing. You know, the, originally the Corvair was supposed to have a, a four-cylinder engine like a Volkswagen. But they felt, eh, Americans like horsepower. You know, if we're going to copy Volkswagen, let's make it bigger, stronger, faster. Which is what they did. You know, the Volkswagen in the period had, what, 36 horsepower or 42 or something like that. So with 80, it gave it a distinct advantage over the Volkswagen transporter at the time. Um, which is what they were going for. But it was still just a little odd for people, you know, because here you see you had this high bed. So to load stuff in here and then it could fall down in there. So that was kind of a disadvantage. Uh, the battery is right in here on that little door there. Chevrolet never missed an opportunity to show you how the ram side worked, and it was actually pretty clever. Come on, come around the other side, and I'll show you. i got to move the camera again. I'm here by myself. Okay, this is why they call it the ram side. This door opens. Of the 11,000 they sold that first year, uh, 11 or 12,000, 80% were the ram side. People like this feature. Uh, the clever part is it's got a heavy rubber bumper, for lack of a better word here, for, so it doesn't scratch the paint. All ramp sides, uh, almost all these Corvair pickup trucks rather, were, uh, were uh, two-tone paint jobs. That's the way they came from the factory. I, I feel funny calling it a pickup truck because I don't really think of it as a pickup truck, but that's what it is and that's what they called it. You see, this would open right here, okay, and then you got the safety catch. Then you lower this down and you can get a motorcycle in there or you could get a lawnmower or whatever you wanted. As I mentioned, these were popular with 
the phone company, they could roll those huge spools of wire. Gardeners loved them because you could just, you know, drive the lawnmower right on, on off the thing. Uh, for other types of applications, not really good because you had that step there. It was Ford Econoline van or a Dodge or, or even the Chevy, the, the pickup, normal Chevy pickup truck was cheaper than this, could carry more, had a bigger bed on it. But interesting idea, just an interesting way to look at a pickup truck, just a totally different interpretation. Four wheel drum brakes, uh, like I said, not the safest thing if you get hit. But this part is built pretty strong. The bed is, well, like I said, you can carry three quarters of a ton in this thing. So that's, that's pretty good. You know, fun thing about finding a vehicle like this is it's easy to restore in that everything is mechanical. Latches, you know, there's no electronics to just drive you crazy. Uh, the only electronics you have wires going to tail lights and stop lights, that's about it. It's just a lot of sandpaper, a lot of metal work, a lot of prep work. But really, there's really not a whole lot to it. It's pretty, pretty simple. You can take every piece off of this and know what it does. You know, modern cars, you go, what does this come up? Where did this go? What is that? Whereas this, it's pretty easy. Come on, let me, let me shut this, and I'll show you what the interior looks like. There we go. Come on, come around the side. Let's show you the interior. Okay, I think Spartan is the best way to describe this. Uh, although this was an option, the armrest, the mirror was like $2. You kind of, as you see, your feet are right here, where, as I mentioned. But you've got his lights, wiper, cigarette lighter. You have to have that. Everybody smoked in 61. Your ignition, speedometer, fuel gauge, ashtray. Got to have that. Everybody smoked in 61. And a radio. Uh, that's an AM, FM radio. It was just AM back then. You have some air vents down here, you got your emergency brake, and a four-speed gearbox, which seemed really sporty when you were a kid, you know. Most, most uh, vehicles in 61 had three on the tree, and that was kind of, you know. Whereas this, wow, it's a four-speed stick shift, you know, it seemed pretty cool. Um, come on, let's put it next door. We'll bring it up on the lift, and we'll show you uh, what it looks like underneath. Oh, feel those 80 horses, huh? Once again, I'm here in my silent garage because all the guys are off because of the pandemic thing. Um, but we're taking care of them. Don't worry about that. Uh, we've got the uh, pickup up on our sterile queen lifts. These lifts are the greatest thing, you know. You can lift up 40,000 pounds of this thing. Of course, this is only 2,600. Now, we restored this car what, about 14, almost, yeah, 13, 14 years ago. And we use it quite a bit, and it just stayed so pristine underneath. You know, George, you know George Swift, our uh, chief mechanic here, he did a wonderful job on this motor. Normally, these are not that oil tight, but this one is, as you can see, no leaks, no drips. Uh, there you go, see, a little, yeah, right there underneath. Very nicely done. And I, I, I haven't cleaned it, you know. We just put it up on the lift after driving it, and I'm surprised at how pristine it is under here. This is your shift linkage here for your four-speed transmission. Seems very sporty, although this is probably the most unsporty vehicle you could imagine. Uh, there's your independent suspension all the way around. And, of course, your unibody deal here is your front end look I, it, boy it just stayed nice nice and clean hard to believe this is a 14 year old restoration but nicely done dual master I, I, I you know i can't remember if we put that on or whether it was standard on trucks back in 61 so if you're a corvair guy you can let me know about that one i'm not sure I didn't think 61 had dual masters, but maybe it did. You know, it's been such a long time since we did this one. But I just wanted to show you what it looked like underneath. So as people interested in that. And uh, probably time now to uh, 
set it down and take it for a ride. Let me show you how these lifts work. Pretty cool. Let me go up. Unlock it. See, I got one hand on the phone. Hang on, it's okay. Here we go. Got it. Okay. Now bring it down. As a safety precaution, you got to have your hand on the lock. And the cool thing about these lift is they uh, actually recharge as they come down. The uh, the re regenerating energy back to the battery as it comes down. So that's that's pretty cool. All right, let's take it for a ride. Actually, this thing goes pretty good for having only 80 horsepower. I guess it's that 128 foot-pounds of torque that seems to help. I think these came with a standard final drive ratio of 355, something like that. The engine's a bit more robust than the standard uh, standard Corvair engine. But you know, I, I like it because it's a driving experience you don't get. It's unique. You know, being ahead of the front wheels or simply sitting on the front wheels, it, 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 as I said before, it reminds me of driving that uh, Mercedes Transporter, which is the strangest thing to drive. Well, you sort of sit up here and got four speeds, which, as I said, 1961 seem extremely exotic. Oh, four speeds, wow. And the complete the complete lack of any safety equipment at all just makes it almost hilarious. I mean, you have no crash protection in front of you. You got, ow, metal dashboard. Uh, the glass is right here. The car is right here. But it was easily twice as powerful as the competing Volkswagen version. And six cylinders instead of four. As I said, Ed Cole was the genius behind the uh, Corvair. I, I, you know, it got such a bad reputation. I, I always get annoyed when I pick up uh, magazines and they have, uh, well, not so much magazines anymore, but especially on the internet, the 50 worst cars of all time. And they'll mention the Corvair without any technical or engineering reason why it's the worst. You know, most Corvair enthusiasts uh, hate Ralph Nader. I don't hate the guy. I've met him, had him on the Tonight Show a couple of times. Not the most humorous guy you've ever met, but hey, that's okay. Uh, I think he did a lot of good. Uh, I, I disagree with him. He wrote a book called Unsafe at Any Speed. And the problem was they didn't want to put the, uh, the torsion bar, the sway bar. Uh, they told people just to run low tire pressure. 15 pounds in the front end. But most people don't pay attention to what's in the owner's manual. And they would just put 32 pounds or 40 pounds in the front. And this would cause it to buckle under and uh, change direction. Uh, and it caused a bunch of accidents. But by the time the book had come out, they corrected the problem. But by that time, the writing was on the wall. General Motors was so incensed that this 28-year-old lawyer went after them that uh, they tried to set him up in a compromising situation with a young woman, and of course that blew up in their face and backfired, and, and then suddenly the Senate wanted to know why General Motors was trying to go after this young lawyer, and they just made it way worse than it actually was. But the real truth of the situation is, the Society of Automotive Engineers, I think in 71 or 73, one of them, uh, they published a paper on the Corvair, and this is unbiased, and he said it was no better or no worse than any other car that appeared. In fact, it was actually better because independent suspension and lightweight and a few other things. So I think the Corvair was uh, vindicated, but by that time it was too late. You know, people just, you know, I had somebody uh, the other day, I was driving one of my Corvairs, a guy goes, I like those, but they blow up, right? I go, no, that was the Pinto, sir, and they don't just blow up. And, uh, you know, people <laughs> people are not real bright when it comes to automotive things. They just believe what anybody tells them. But anyway, I think the Corvair, certainly the most innovative American car ever developed. I mean, just a complete, at least in America, clean sheet of paper, so different than anything else anyone had ever done before. And this was 
the strangest pickup truck anybody had ever seen. It just because it didn't look like a pickup truck. You know, kids loved it. To this day, when I drive this thing around, people point and wave, and you know, it, it seems to get a pretty good reaction from people. And it's kind of fun to drive. It's just the handling characteristics are so goofy. You just have to respect it and drive it properly. Remember when I was a kid in, I think in Lawrence, Massachusetts, the next town over, there was a Honda dealer, and he had one of these, and he would deliver new Hondas to people, you know, just in the 50cc step through, you'd put it up there and you'd drive it and put the ramp down and drive it off, and you know, big deal. But the fun thing about these kind of vehicles are they're easy to restore because they're basically, it's basically like putting together a model, you know? You, you really don't need the instructions to figure out how everything goes. Everything is nuts and bolts and, and, and no electronics, no computer. Uh, that's what makes it easy. Just a lot of sanding and painting and prepping and that's about it. This is one of the first vehicles we did at my garage, and uh, it turned out great. I'm told that there are people who make a five-speed for these, which has got to be pretty interesting. If you like Corvairs, you might want to go back and look at the YouTube show we did on my uh, Yanko Stinger. Uh, Don Yanko was a well, I guess he was the Carroll Shelby of Chevrolet. He took Chevys and, and uh, raced them competitive, competitively. And what he did was he bought 100 Corvairs in white, got his own serial number. I have car number 54, and set out to build a car to take on Porsche, which he did in 1966. And I believe he won. He won the uh, SCAA championship, something like that. Uh, yeah, it was very impressive. He had a stage one, a stage two, and a stage three. I have a stage two with the four carburetors. And uh, it's 180 horsepower. And it goes great. I mean, when you realize the Porsche Turbo didn't have that until, God, probably the, what, middle, late 70s? It's so funny to drive this because there's no hood. You can't look, I mean, it's, it ends right there, which makes it easy to position and park. As much as I like driving the supercars, you know, this thing is, uh, is a lot of fun too. It's just, it's just so different than, from anything that you could buy now. It's very light, very spindly. I love having a four speed right here. Just kind of, it bounces a lot. It just makes you smile. And you get three people in the front. I mean, 80 horsepower doesn't sound like much, but you're only moving maybe 2,600 pounds. I think that's the, the weight of this thing. Air conditioning was even an option on Corvairs, although I never saw a Corvair with it. Corvair was also the first turbocharged car. Technically, it was the Oldsmobile, but they didn't sell enough of those to make any difference. Uh, so the Corvair was, Pretty advanced. Ed Cole was quite a guy. These pickup trucks never quite caught on. People, they kind of like their traditional American looking pickup truck. But I thought it was just a great idea. I mean, it's literally, you would think this car had power steering if you didn't know. Because one of the big drawbacks, especially if you're in Minnesota or someplace like that, you basically had, for all intents and purposes, no heater. I mean, it had a heater, but uh, the blowing hot air, yeah, not much. But you know, it's fun to drive. Your hands and feet are always doing something. That's what I like about it. Commanding view of the road, pretty softly sprung. You know, it's funny, I rarely wash my cars. I just wipe them down with some of our detail spray that we have. And they last forever. You know, water will just <laughs> rust and get it all the drain gutters don't drain properly, and then you wind up with them. But you know, if you can keep it out of, out of the wet weather, as I said, this thing was restored probably 13, 14 years ago. It still looks brand new, even underneath, if you don't get it wet. I mean, it's not possible in most climates, but in California it is. 
if there's any positive side to this whole pandemic thing is the fact the roads are empty. You can kind of drive without sitting in bumper to bumper traffic. I like having a vehicle that needs me, you know, needs me to shift, needs me to do stuff. You know, modern cars are so maintenance free that you don't, you don't really bond with them at all. And the great thing about Corvairs is, God, the clubs are terrific. Since they built 1.8 million of these, there's plenty of engines available, plenty of parts available. A place called Clark's, we get a lot of parts in Clark's Corvair parts. Uh, and the people in the club are all terrific. You know, it's fun to collect sort of regular cars, cars where you can find parts at a reasonable price, and, and that's what's great about Corvairs. They haven't gone nuts. I mean, obviously, if you find a Yanko Stinger, that's gonna run you some serious money, but God, you can find Corses and Monzas for, you know, 10 grand, something like that. And they're a lot of fun to drive. They're, they're sporty. You know, I can remember when I was a kid, you pick up road and track. They used to run ads on the back of road and track for a company called MG Mitten. And uh, they used to have all these kind of things, you know. You could get the, the string back driving gloves and the little cap and the guy with the pipe. And you drive in there, you know, sporty Corvair Monza convertible with a four speed, you know. These have become, become quite rare, rare, these ramp sides. There's just not many of them left. Most of them are owned by the phone company or by fleets. And they just got beaten to death and then trashed. Uh, every now and then Hemmings would have one in the, sitting in a junkyard or something like that, but not very often. You know, as much as I enjoy doing the Paganis and the Zondas and the McLarens and the Ferraris, there's something about these kind of cars that just, I think, touch more people, because more people have experienced them, more people have memories, things they did, places they went, kids they raised, whatever it might be, you know? So it's kind of fun. And this is the kind of car that's not going to break the bank if you go to a store. You know, it's just a fun hobby car with a, a great club to back it up and a great spare scheme so you can get plenty of parts and all that kind of thing. So, and with the pandemic going on, like I said, you don't want to be driving around in some fancy thing. You know, something like this just kind of makes people smile and reflect back perhaps a simpler time. and. Uh, just all the kind of stuff. And boy, this was a simpler time, wasn't it? <laughs> you get the crash in this thing, and you are simply dead. That that that's it. There's there's no protection. So you 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 know you screw up. It's your fault. It's your fault, pal. That's the way it works. Anyway, listen. I hope you enjoyed enjoyed this little drive, and uh, we'll see you next week with some more stuff. See you then. Thanks, everybody. Mm-hmm. <laughs>